Good evening, and thank you for attending this live stream performance uh, from the College of St. Benedict, St. John's University Music Department. I'm Dr. Ed Turley, and I'm joined by my two esteemed colleagues, uh, Dr. Amy Grinsteiner and Brother Paul Vincent Niebauer. And we'd like to perform the Carnival of the Animals by Camille Saint-Saëns. I'll give just a little, a few, little bit of a historical background about Carnival, and um, then uh, Brother Paul uh, Vincent will talk a little bit about the poetry, and then we'll do the uh, performance. Following the performance, Dr. Grinsteiner will coordinate a question and answer session um, that we're receiving questions during the, the concert. Saint his dates are 1835 to 1921, uh, one of those incredible longevities in music, 86 years old. Uh, he, he knew both Berlioz and Stravinsky. Uh, Carnival uh, was composed in 1886. He regarded it as a rather fun piece. He was uh, composing it concurrently with his third symphony, the organ symphony. Uh, it was a work intended for private performance, and in fact, the second performance of uh, Carnival was attended by Franz Liszt, who was a friend of Saint-Saëns. It's originally scored for 11 instruments, and it's often done with full orchestra. We'll be doing a transcription tonight for one piano, four hands, by Lucien Garbin. Uh, we'll be using two pianos, uh, practicing social distance of the uh, uh, time that we're in. Saint-Saëns did not want the work published during his lifetime. He was uh, desiring more of an image of a high art music composer, and he felt that Carnival would probably give him a reputation as writing very light and frivolous music. Nevertheless, these are extraordinary musical caricatures, and uh, he did consent to having the famous cello solo, The Swan, which is one of the animals uh, published during his lifetime. Just a few of the highlights of it. Uh, he's quoting a lot of, uh, a lot of movements uh, and melodies and so forth from the standard canon of classical literature. Uh, the Tortoises, number four, fourth movement, is a slow rendition of the famous Gallop Infernal, the Can Can, uh, from Offenbach's opera Orpheus in the Underworld. Uh, movement number five, uh, the famous uh, the elephant, the famous uh, bass solo uh, for the string bass section. Uh, melody is drawing from the scherzo from Midsummer Night's Dream by Mendelssohn, which is very fast work. It's done here very slowly by the elephant. Uh, movement number seven, the aquarium, a very fascinating piece. It's impressionistic sounding. It's a, it's a water piece and in many respects looks ahead uh, to the impressionism of uh, the late 19th century and early 20th century that we see in music. Uh, Saint-Saëns was very, of course, uh, steeped very heavily in the 19th century tradition of Romanticism, but we see these occasional moments in, of, of very forward, progressive-looking brilliance. Also noted is the slow movement from his fifth piano concerto, the Egyptian, uh, which makes use of rather Javanese gamelan qualities in it. Uh, the aquarium makes use of a glissando uh, on the piano running up the, uh, the uh, treble register, uh, which was originally, he scored that for glass harmonica, uh, giving it a, a very unique timbre. Um, and of course, the glass harmonica, a mechanical version of it, was invented by uh, none other than Ben Franklin. Uh, movement number eight, characters with long ears. And as soon as you hear that movement, you'll know what it's imitating. Uh, he spec it speculated that um, Sanson was thinking of music critics for this one. <laughs> Um, the number 11 uh, is one of the animals is pianists. He's satirizing pianists as animals. Uh, it incorporates finger exercises and scales, very much following the French tradition of piano technique and piano pedagogy. Uh, it's quoting Hannon's very, um, very noted work, The Virtuoso Pianist. Uh, very fascinating work, number 12, fossils. Uh, the dinosaurs uh, and fossils. Uh, Saint-Saëns used a xylophone originally in this to the evoke uh, the quality of the skeleton bones. It also is very noted for its quotes. It uh, quotes Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star, also a French nursery rhyme, Au clair de la lune, by the light of the moon, and also the famous aria from Barber of Seville by Rossini, Una voce poco fa, a voice from a while back. So very fitting to the, to the uh, character in the title of the movement. 
Um, movement number 13, the swan, was, like I said, was the only movement to be published during Sanson's lifetime. It's a frequent solo encore by Yo-Yo Ma. Uh, also, it was choreographed in 1905 by Fokin, who uh, choreographed also Firebird and Petrushka of Stravinsky. He choreographed it for Anna Pavlova, uh, the famous uh, Russian ballerina, um, and uh, it was titled The Dying Swan. She gave uh, about 4,000 performances of Dying Swan, uh, making it a very significant uh, work in the, in the literature. The final movement, number 14, uh, very interesting movement. Uh, it quotes all of, many of the previous animals uh, in the character in a rollicking finale. Just a little bit about it, we're delighted to have Brother Paul Vincent Niebauer uh, read uh, and narrate uh, the Ogden Nash verse. Uh, 1949, American poet Ogden Nash wrote a set of humorous verses to accompany each movement of the, for a Columbia Masterworks recording of Carnival of the Animals, which was conducted by Andre Castellanitz with the New York Philharmonic and pianist Leonid Hambro and Yasha Zayde. They re, uh, the, uh, the, were, the verses were recited on the original album, uh, the original recording by the famous English actor Noel Coward. The final verse makes reference to Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey. And so who else but a former ringmaster and performance director from Ringling Brothers to do the Ogden Nash readings for us? I'd like to hand the mic over to Brother Paul Vincent Niebauer of St. John's Abbey. Thank you. Dr. Ed Turley, thank you. You're wonderful. Um, it's, it's great listening to Ed speak because I don't know if the camera showed, but I was writing some things down. So Camille Sasson wrote this in 1886. And then in 1950, 68, almost 70 years later, or 49 actually, Ed said, um, uh, Ogden Nash, uh, who died in 71. So students out there, he was gone long before you were born. But so 70 years later, 68 years later, Ogden Nash does his, uh, which was called, he, he was an American poet well known for his light verse, of which he wrote over 500 pieces. Uh, and he had unconventional uh, rhyming schemes. He was declared the country's best known producer of humorous poetry. I certainly grew up with his name, Ogden Nash was well known. And so here we are, 70 years later, <laughs> When, from when Ogden Nash wrote the, um, the prose. So some of it is, understandably, dated, of course. Uh, so let me give you just a couple of terms or vocabulary so that your listening enjoyment can be enhanced. Um, a meringue, which if you're a pastry chef or cook, um, you will know what a meringue is. It's a, it's a type of dessert or candy and with light and fluffy peaks. Maybe you've had lemon meringue pie. Um, the Andrews sisters. Uh, these were three sisters born in Minneapolis, pre-World War II, became wildly popular. Of course, because the three sisters, they were very musically uh, inclined, had excellent ears, and uh, sang very close harmonies. Um, you might have heard of the Boogie Woogie Bugle Boy of Company B. That is one of their hit songs. Um, so the Andrew Sisters is going to be um, mentioned in the readings, as well as the Road to Mandalay, which I had to look up. I didn't know about that, but that's a title that refers to a wildly popular love song with lyrics, lyrics by Rudyard Kipling, and music by Oli Speaks. I didn't know who Oli Speaks was, but people at the beginning of the 1900s certainly did because it sold over one million uh, copies of sheet music. Uh, f f finally, I think, Anna Pavlova. Pavlova is mentioned during the Swan sequence, and she was a very well-known Russian prima ballerina, 19th century, late 19th century, and early 20th century, uh, most recognized for her creation of the role of the dying swan, which, of course, that's what Mr. Nash is doing, is connecting two rather curious um, 
thoughts there. And finally, Barnum and Bailey and Ringling, if you don't know, those were the two largest circuses that ever toured the United States of America. Camille Sasson was racked with pains when people addressed him as Saint Sains. He held the human race to blame because it could not pronounce his name. So he turned with metronome and fife to glorify other forms of life. Be quiet, please, for here begins his salute to feathers, furs, and fins. The lion is the king of beasts and husband of the lioness. Gazelles and things on which he feasts address him as your highness. There are those who admire that roar of his in the African jungles and veldts. But I think wherever a lion is, I'd rather be somewhere else. The rooster is a roistering hoodlum. His battle cry is cock-a-doodlum. Hands in pockets, cap over eye. He whistles at pullets passing by. ever harked to the jackass wild, which scientists call the onager. It sounds like the laugh of an idiot child or a hebcat on a harmonager. 
But do not sneer at the jackass wild. There is method in his hee-haw. For with maidenly blush and accent mild, the Jenny ass answers, she haw. Come crown my brow with leaves of myrtle. I know the tortoise is a turtle. Come carve my name in stone immortal. I know the tortoise is a tortle. I know to my profound despair, I bet on one to beat a hare. I also know I'm now a pauper because of its tortly, turtly, Torpor. Elephants are useful friends, equipped with handles at uh, both ends. They have a wrinkled, moth-proof hide. Their teeth are upside down, outside. If you think the elephant preposterous, you've probably never seen a rhinoceros.
the kangaroo can jump incredible. He has to jump because he's edible. I could not eat a kangaroo, but many fine Australians do. Those with cookbooks as well as boomerangs prefer him in tasty kangaroo meringues. Some fish are minnows. Some are whales. People like dimples. Fish like scales. Some fish are slim and some are round. They don't get cold. They don't get drowned. But every fishwife fears for her fish. What we call mermaids, they call merfish. In the world of mules, well, there are no rules.
cuckoos lead bohemian lives. They fail as husbands and as wives. Therefore, they cynically disparage everybody else's marriage. Puccini was Latin, and Wagner Teutonic, and birds are incurably philharmonic. Suburban yards and rural vistas are filled with avian Andrew sisters. The skylark sings a rondelay, the crow sings the road to Mandalay, the nightingale sings a lullaby, and the seagull sings a gullaby. That's what shepherds listened to in Arcadia before someone invented the radio. Some claim that pianists are human, and quote the case of Mr. Truman. Sasson, upon the other hand, considered them a scurvy band. Ape-like they are, he said, and simian, instead of normal men and women. Thank you. 
at midnight in the museum hall, the fossils gathered for a ball. There were no drums or saxophones, but just the clatter of their bones. A rolling, rattling, carefree circus of mammoth polkas and mazurkas. Pterodactyls and brontosauruses sang ghostly prehistoric choruses. Amid the mastodonic wassail, I caught the eye of one small fossil. Cheer up, sad world, he said, and winked. It's kind of fun to be extinct. <laughs> The swan can swim while sitting down. For pure conceit, he takes the crown. He looks in the mirror over and over and claims to have never heard of Pavlova.
Now we reach the grand finale. Anamale, carnavale, noises new to sea and land issue from the skillful band. All the strings contort their features imitating crawly creatures. All the brasses look like mumps from blowing oompa, oompa, umps. In outdoing Barnum and Bailey and Ringling, Sasson has done a miraculous thingling. Well, thank you very much for listening. It's a wonderful piece. Um, if it's the first time you've ever heard it, that's okay. It's the first time I've ever performed it. So uh, it's, uh, it's around, though. You'll hear it the rest of your life in various contexts and movies, just different movements. And hopefully you'll get to hear an orchestra play it um, someday as well. Now you know the piece. Um, before we take questions from YouTube, I, there was a question before we started about happiness. Um, that we'd like to kind of start by addressing a little bit. Um, Ed, I think you said Sasson was quite happy when he wrote this, is that right? right. Yeah. Yeah, he was re uh, reported to have uh, written a letter to Durand, which is the famous uh, French uh, publishing house, uh, also published all of uh, DBC. Um, but he wrote a letter to uh, Durand saying that, I know I should be working on my third symphony, uh, the <laughs> organ symphony. But he said, this, uh, this one is of such amusement. He really enjoyed uh, creating these caricatures of, of the animals and, and um, interweaving the elements of musical satire in there, the uh, mules or, or the critics and uh, the elegance of the swan and uh, the, uh, just the uh, caricature of a kangaroo, all of them transferred to musical elements uh, within very much a tonal, uh, tonal framework and uh, a just very intelligent composition, I think. But the fact that it did give him joy, and I think that uh, we've been, uh, we oftentimes think of uh, you know, these great giants of music as being these kind of rock star sort of happiness, but uh, you look into their lives and their biographies and, and they experience tremendous grief, tremendous sadness, depression, um, and in many respects, um, I remember uh, singing Mahler Second, 
Uh, and the great choral director, Fiora Contina, told the choir uh, before we started, she said, Mahler uh, was a miserable man and that, that his music was a release. And so she used that to motivate the, and adrenalize the choir. And it did. <laughs> <laughs> sort of a different way of thinking sometimes about happiness. I mean, uh, happiness means working, means writing a long composition like you just heard. Could that be happy? But, you know, for some people, work is life, life is work, and it's all just living. I heard, I think Richard Branson said that once, it's all just living. And that's an interesting way to think about, about happiness in the various stages we might go through. Well, I'll tell you, were you happy when you were performing? <laughs> You seemed happy. Yes, and, and that's, uh, uh, that's, as always, it's a tremendous pleasure to collaborate with Dr. Grinsteiner and then to have uh, Brother Paul Vincent uh, to do the Ogden Nash first. He, uh, from our first rehearsal um, uh, about a, oh, I think a week or 10 days ago, and, and uh, oh, he, he just immediately uh, uh, found, I said, you know, the wit, the intelligence, the humor, and, uh, and just the cleverness of it and the way you brought it off. Thank you very much for adding that to it. Well, you're so welcome. I'm, I'm sorry that we have to wear masks <laughs> because I think if you would have seen us, yeah. our mouths, you know, you would have seen huge grins, yeah. right? Yeah. And I can hear Amy laughing through <laughs> the piece and Ed, Ed laughing as well. And of course, yeah, so it's, it's too bad that these are hiding. Mm -hmm. are really mm -hmm. extreme. It, to me, this was so much fun. Mm -hmm. So happy. So much fun. While we were working, but fun. As it's well. Same, right? mm -hmm. It's all living. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anna, do we have some, any questions from you two? What part of the piece was the hardest to prepare for the performance? Well, Ed had all the hard notes. He oh, took the hard part. Mine was quite easy. So, Ed, do you want to take oh, this? Uh, I think technically the uh, the hyenas, uh, a lot of finger work. But it, uh, as always is the case with Saint Sans, uh, it's very intelligently written. It fits the hand, uh, and it uh, creates tremendous excitement in what he does. Uh, the uh, uh, the aquarium. Uh, sounds very facile, very very bright, very shimmering and so forth. Uh, those arpeggios are actually well within an octave hand position, but the challenge is to try to get it really even there with it. And, and I, I think, think uh, oh. I think also Amy, I think the elephant is, you know, even though it is, it's that, that famous melody from the can-can, the to slow it way down like that, you know, and still give it the inflection you did was, uh, was just marvelous. It's fun being an elephant once in a while. <laughs> I do like, Ed and I like to play two piano recitals, and normally when we have an audience in front of us, I like to do a little demonstration of what it's like to play with two pianos across from each other like this. Um, so we, we don't get to see each other much. So one of the difficult things about preparing the piece is just the ensemble. We don't have a conductor keeping us in time. We're not counting out loud. And this is what it looks like when I look over at Ed. This is what I see. <laughs> uh, there's not a lot of visual cues there. <laughs> so you might have seen his head nod to count us off for a movement or something. But just getting used to the timing and the breath is uh, it's one of the difficulties, but also it's really wonderful as we rehearse to put that together where we don't have to think about it quite as much, but it just takes a little time. Yeah. Do we have another question? Which movement or two is your favorite recital? Oh, you go first. Well, I don't know if you noticed, but right before the swan started, I was a little distracted with some papers. You didn't. There was a wasp that was crawling around on the keys. Yep. Normally, the swan is my favorite, but tonight it was a little distracting. But I knew he, he kept crawling, and he, kept, he started down on the keys when you were reading the poetry, and I thought, oh, this has got to go. I cannot work around the wasp. Normally, it's the swan, but... Um, oh, I'm so sorry. I just started. <laughs> that's okay. You were just kind of there, and I thought, she's ready. Let's go. And I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. It's all right. What's your favorite movement, Ed? Oh... I, I think, you know, uh, in terms of fun to play, of course, the finale, without a doubt. Um, I think the most imaginative, uh, you know, compositionally, uh, 
even though the chord structure is very traditional, I think that the aquarium is very imaginative. Uh, I think fossils, um, you know, originally that was, uh, he intended that with a xylophone. Um, and uh, uh, the timbre of the xylophone imitating uh, the quality of bones and stuff, and it's, it's this kind of rollicking dance. And then he quotes, you know, una voce poco fa, you know, a voice from a while back, and that's the dinosaurs. And, uh, um, and so I think the, uh, the infusion uh, of, uh, uh, of satire and of, and of the uh, word painting or the color painting, coloristic painting of it makes that so very enjoyable. Fossils, very enjoyable to play. I think you were mentioning I, you enjoy. I like fossils too, yeah. Mm. I just wanted to talk about the wasp with the <laughs> swan. <laughs> so what is your favorite poem? Oh, goodness. Um, you know, I mean, uh, it's, it's funny because the fossils I enjoy because everything else is alive. Mm -hmm. But then all of a sudden we go not only into the evening, but we go back. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's a wonderful shift mm -hmm. for a narrator mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anna, one or two more maybe? What do you... <laughs> did any <laughs> the question was did any of what I narrated remind me of my real life experience with the circuses is there is that did someone autograph that comment uh, no. oh we'll talk later okay um, <laughs> <laughs> well you know I have the best seat in the house right here I have these two magnificent uh, virtuosos behind me I could not only hear the music, I felt the music. And so th th the short answer is yes, it did. And one of the pieces that really made me remember and remember of animals that I could show you, share with you their names, are the elephants. It was so real, mm -hmm. absolutely real. Of course, the lion, absolutely. Uh, but the elephant... You know, I think elephants have more character than almost any animal. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah, that was spectacular. So, yes, yes. How about one more? Uh, how long did you work on this piece with each other? Yeah, go ahead. Well, Ed and I have been playing together in ensemble like this to piano, I don't know, maybe five years now? No, at least. Five or six years. We'll do a recital about every um, year, year and a half. So it's, it's interesting because so this for us was a new piece to play together, but we've been performing together for so long that we can kind of tackle the new notes. But it's a, a comfortable like, working relationship. We understand a little bit more how each other thinks. So we figure out the notes much faster than we used to. Uh, we don't have to talk about it as much. We kind of can read each other's minds and we can hear um, familiar ways of playing and we can work off of that. So that's a, not really answering the question, I realize. Um, but we probably have been rehearsing over the last month together, I would say once a week. And then this last week here, um, a couple of times, and with Brother Paul, a couple of times. I, this is the first time I've done something like this, uh, certainly with these two individuals. Um, what I was so struck by is the incredible uh, politeness when they're rehearsing, always checking in with each other. How is that for you? Is that, does that, how's that tempo? Do you want to try, no, that's fine, that's, incredible <laughs> politeness hospitality um it it was uh, really edifying really marvelous if uh, they look that way that's because they are that way <laughs> not, i think that's that's grounded very much uh, uh i really uh in looking at uh my uh, career at csbsju and the tremendous colleagues that i've been able to collaborate with uh uh, so many times over the years in full, full solo faculty recitals and um, in ensemble performances, pastiche, and it really is a to, um, very much is um, 
uh, in talking with Kim Casling, it's, it, um, we share kind of, it's a, it's a privilege to do what we do. And uh, so it's, uh, it really is a treasure. Yeah. Well, thank you for joining us. Thank you for trying this new format. It's brand new for us. There's no live audience. We're wearing masks. It's a, it's a new day for this semester. So thanks for tuning in and, and keep checking out the website. We're, we're going to do more of these. So have a great night. And thank you. Thank you.